They can take your world. They can take your heart. Cut you loose from all you know. But if it's your fate, then every step forward will always be a step closer to home. Guys, we're continuing in our series, Loading Screen, and I have been, honestly, this has probably been for me the most spiritually beneficial series also for me. I love all of them always being benefited by what I'm studying, what I'm teaching. The Bible is always changing my life, but I do have to be honest, in three years of our church, that this personally for me has been the most spiritually beneficial, and I'm just so excited to continue it with you. If you're just popping in, you haven't been here with us along the journey of the loading screen, essentially our premise is the loading screen, what are we going to do while we wait? There are so many of you that in different seasons of life, maybe for you it's you've been waiting on employment, which by the way, Cliff, praise God, you got that new job. Maybe you're waiting on healing for a sickness in your body. Maybe you've got some family issues. Your divorce, your, you know, your marriage is on the rocks, and it's potentially leading to divorce. And you're waiting, 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 waiting on God to finally show up and do something. And you feel like God hasn't been listening. And you feel like, God, where has he been? Has he been idle? Is he even aware? Where is God? And we're talking about while we're in the waiting phase, while we're in the loading screen, what are we going to do while we wait? How are we going to keep on learning to trust God? Because sometimes it feels like we're just in the loading screen forever, in the waiting zone, in the waiting room forever and ever and ever. And there's something that has made people like me and maybe some of you in the chat also feel like we've been waiting forever. And that was for the release of Kingdom Hearts 3. Okay, them people's made us wait 13 years for the trilogy finally to come out. Kingdom Hearts 3 finally released this this week and I have been out playing it like I have no life and like I get paid to play video games, which I do. Thank you, Jesus. I have been playing it nonstop and I have been absolutely loving it and can tell you, although we were in the loading screen forever, 13 years, it was worth the wait. The game is so good. The graphics are on another level. The cutscenes are like they're heart wrenching. The combat system, I have to say, finally is smooth. Okay. No offense, Square Enix, but number one and number two definitely could use some work, brother. Okay. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the combat system is so good, so fun, so versatile. I love it. I love it. And I love it. And of course, in Kingdom Hearts, probably one of the biggest, most famous staples in the game is right. I'm about to whip it out during the sermon. That's right, baby. Is the good. Good old Keyblade, okay? If you guys do not know what Kingdom Hearts is, it is an incredible game that essentially revolves around the idea of the Heartless, which is the really one of the main antagonists, a thing that they are trying to stop. I'm not going to explain the lore because I'll be honest. If, you, if I tried to, my sermons would be even longer than they already are. But the Heartless are one of the main bad guys in the game, and the weapon... Them. If you're going to really stand a chance, if Sora, the main character, is really going to accomplish the things it needs to do, if he's going to be able to beat the bad guys, if he's going to do everything that he needs to do, he's going to need to depend on his keyblade. I know some of you are like, why is the main weapon a key? It's a long, it's a long story. There's like, there's a bunch of games. Don't worry, the lore's in there. But I have to tell you that Sora is very, very, very dependent on his keyblade. Anytime something bad happens, anytime enemies appear, anytime a crisis begins, in a second, boom, Sora has his go-to. He has the thing on which he depends on most, his Keyblade. Anytime trouble starts, anytime crisis begins, this is what he depends on. This is what Sora is aware of, that without my Keyblade, I'm never going to be able to accomplish the goal that I've set out to save the world, to defeat the Heartless, to defeat Ants and the Wise, to defeat Organization 13. Without the Keyblade, I'm never going to be able to accomplish my goals. Without the Keyblade, if I do not depend on what I need most, I will never, ever, ever be able to do what I have set out to do. And Sora is super duper 100% dependent on his Keyblade. And in our lives, there are things that you and I are dependent on. Sometimes when it comes to being able to pay our bills, we're very, very dependent on our work ethic. We're very, very dependent on our own ability to work hard, to bring income. We're very, very dependent on our jobs for many areas of our lives, we're very dependent on ourselves, very dependent on our skills, very dependent on our, our charisma, our personality, our gifts, or whatever it may be. Same way that Sora 
knew that he would never be able to accomplish what he was created to accomplish, would never be able to do what he needed to do if he was not dependent on his keyblade. I want to ask you, what is it that in your life you know that you need to depend on in order to continue? Now, I want to say that the church answer is God. The church answer is always God. I'm dependent on God. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, that's the big church answer. That's the answer that so many of us are thinking in our hearts. What I want to talk through tonight is really a time of really examining our heart, examining our lives, and checking, are we truly dependent on God? Or have we allow, allowed our hearts to become dependent on other things? And tonight I've entitled my message, which is a question I want to ask you, that as Sora was dependent on what he needed most, his keyblade, for you, what's your keyblade? What is it that in your life when crisis happens? What is it that in your life when things go bad that you run to first? The church answer is, of course, God. Oh, I pray. Read the Bible. Hallelujah. Put an amen in the chat. Of course, that's the good old church Christian answer. But if we'll really get honest with ourselves, in the year 2019, where technology is so high, where Google is a thing, where I can talk to my phone and get answers, because of the world we live in, have we become less dependent on God? more dependent on ourselves, more dependent on technology, more dependent on our friends, more dependent on our family. What is your keyblade? What is the thing that you are depending on more so than if you really be honest, then maybe you are depending on God. And what I want to do tonight is I want to read through a story in the, in the book of Exodus chapter 33. It's going to be on the page and on, on the screen in just a minute here. And we're going to begin to read through the story of Moses as they are navigating through just escaping the Egyptians. They've got the Israelite people and Moses is navigating with a huge group of people. And they are trying to reach the promised land. They're trying to get through to God's blessing, to the thing that God promised them. But they had a lot of bumps along the road. It's an incredible story. I would challenge you really to read the whole book of Exodus. But I want to talk through tonight. And this passage that we're going to read is something that I believe that Moses can teach us. Three keys on how to depend on God. And I believe that as we read through this story, it's going to cause us to check our hearts and to really be honest with ourselves, to learn from the lessons of Moses as we dive in, asking ourselves, what's your keyblade? And learning the three keys on how to depend on God. And I believe the first thing that Moses is showing us here is how to depend on God for direction. I want to start reading this passage to you. We're going to spend our entire time dissecting this, really learning it, figuring out what it means, and applying it to our lives as we unpack the three keys of depending on God. Verse number 7, Exodus 33, says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it. He'd put it up outside the camp some distance away, and they would call it the tent of meeting. We're going to learn in a second who Moses was meeting with. And anyone inquiring of the Lord, anyone that wanted to talk to the Lord, would go to the tent of meeting. They would go there to talk to God, meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the, people's, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their own tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. This was a big deal. This was Moses. Back in the day, we couldn't just like close our eyes and pray and talk to Jesus. There was certain events that needed to take place in order for certain people to be able to have communication with God and this being one of those moments and Moses being one of those people. So this, this gathered a crowd. This was a big deal. Moses was about to go talk to God. In verse number nine, as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance. We're going to dissect the pillar of cloud, talk about what that is in a minute. But the pillar of cloud would come down and it would stay at the entrance of the tent. While the Lord spoke with Moses, all the people are standing outside because they're like, oh my goodness, what are they talking about? Moses is literally speaking with God. This is a huge moment. Verse number 10, whenever the people saw the pillar of clouds standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and they worshiped God because they were literally viewing a miracle, each at the entrance to their own tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, verse number 12, you've been telling me lead these people. God, you, man, you, God, you told me to save the Israelites from the Egyptian. You know, they, were, they were being slaves. You sent us on this big journey. You've been telling me to lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. 
You ever had a moment in your life where maybe God gave you a piece of the puzzle but didn't give you the whole thing? God says, you told me something I needed to do, but I don't have all the details, man. He says, you've told me to lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. You found God's blessing with me. And if you are pleased with me, God, then teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find blessing and favor with you. Remember, God, this, this nation, these, these are your people. And the Lord, God answered Moses. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses says something that I love that we're going to come back to here in a little bit. Verse number 15. Then Moses said to him, being God, God, if your presence does not go with us, then don't send us up from here. And I believe in this passage, we're going to talk about tonight three keys on how to depend on God. I believe the first one that Moses shows us is he, he begins to explain to us what it looks like to depend on God for direction. I want to pick up at verse number nine. Look what it says in this passage. And Moses went into the pillar of cloud, would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And I want to dissect what this is a little bit. We saw that phrase pop up a few times, the pillar of cloud. Now, now what exactly is that? And actually, I've actually brought a picture that I want to show you kind of what this was. On the screen, you're going to see in the sky, literally this pillar, you know, kind of like a column, a pole, this pillar of cloud off in the distance and what this was used for was this was them being dependent on God for direction because these people were trying to find their way they had just escaped years and years of being slaves to the Egyptian people these are the Israelites Moses saves them and now he's attempting to follow God's way to bring them to the promised land where they don't need to be in slavery anymore they're not going to starve they're going to be blessed they're going to be in the place where God has promised to them but they don't have a map. There's no, there's no Siri, GPS. They don't know where they're going. So literally, they were so dependent on God for direction that that pillar of cloud literally was guiding them. This is why the people gathered around it in sheer awe because it was a miracle of God that during the day, this pillar of cloud would appear from the sky and essentially it was God's waypoint that said, hey, this is the next place for you to go. And then when you get here, I'm going to move it again. It was a miracle of God. And then at night, the pillar of cloud turned to a pillar of fire that produced light for them to be able to see so they could keep on following God's direction. They were 100% dependent. God, we, God, we don't know where we are. We've never been here. We come from Egypt where we were slaved. Now we're going to a new place, the promised land. Where, we, where is that? God, we are dependent on you for direction. And I want to tell you that in our lives, we need to be dependent on God for direction. There are so many decisions that you and I are making on a week-to-week -week basis, on a month-to-month -month basis, some serious life decisions that we're making. And I'd ask you, are you involving God in your decisions? Are you involving and realizing that you're dependent on God for direction? You're depending on God for the next steps. Now, God, if you don't provide a pillar of cloud, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. Have you ever made decisions that required so much faith that if God didn't answer you, you didn't know what you were going to do? But here's what we do in 2019. We've got technology, man. We've got gifts. We've got talents. We've got really cool stuff. That instead of just being dependent, raw dependence on God, we have, we have technology. We have backup plans, and backup plans are great. But we've lost that raw dependence on God. We say, well, God, you know, I've got a high paying job. You know, I'm not trusting you for the food on my table, I'm trusting my job on the food for my table. And then if that, you know, if that doesn't work out, then God, you know, I'll just, I'll just call up some of my resources, call up some of my connections, and they'll give me direction. Those things are great. But have we really lost truly our, our raw dependence for God? We've been talking through as a community that we're going to begin reading this book, Circle Maker. Circle Maker is a book that really is going to talk to us about prayer. It's really going to begin to teach us and how to really trust and depend on God. And what we're going to be doing every week as I continue to lead us in talking through what portions of the book we're going to be reading before our next week of meeting together for church. And I talked to you guys about reading week, uh, chapters 1 and 2 before tonight's message. And we're going to just take principles out of here. Can I tell you that this book, this is a great book. It changed my life. But can I tell you that, that this is just a book? 
So we're going to be taking principles out of this book and applying it to the book that really changes lives, the Word of God. Because this book is just black and white letters. This book is alive. It's active. But can I tell you that in this book, there's some principles that are going to lead us towards trusting God. And I was reading through chapters 1 and 2, and something just stuck out to me like, 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 it was just so crazy when I read it, and I felt like God wanted us to talk about it today. It's in chapter, verse, uh, page 15, and this is what it says. I felt underqualified and overwhelmed, but that is when God has you right where he wants you. That is how you learn to live on raw dependence. And raw dependence on God is the material in which God performs his greatest miracles. And I love that principle because I think about Moses and, and, and the Israelites. And the reality is that one of the reasons that they were so dependent on God was because they didn't have a GPS. They didn't have navigation systems. They didn't have any of those things. So literally for them, they needed to 100% depend on God. Because if God didn't help them, they were going to be lost. But the reason it's hard for you and I to depend on God today is because if God doesn't, if God doesn't tell us where to go, man, we can't, I got to go. Siri, which, which job should I take? Hey, hey, Siri, what direction should I go? Hey, let me, let me text some of my buddies. I can get an answer in like 13 seconds. Man, I've been praying for a few weeks. God hasn't answered me. One of my buddies will give me advice like 45 seconds. And, and, we, and we, we've lost our dependence on God because there's so many other things that we can put our trust in. But I believe that Moses is teaching us that we need to get back to our roots of having a raw dependence on God. I want to put that picture back up. Do you realize that this was a miracle of God? This pillar of cloud. This is what they knew they needed in order to get from place to place. Which means that Moses was forced to be in position where he had to trust God for miracles. He had to trust God to move in his life. He wasn't going to settle for anything less. He said, God, I want to see a pillar of cloud. God, I need a miracle. God, I need you to do something big. I need you to do something so big, so miraculous, that when you do it, everyone will know that it was you. Because ain't nobody going to put a pillar of cloud in the sky. Ain't nobody going to do something so miraculous. And he was teaching us, we need to remind ourselves to have a raw dependence on God. Or have we, in 2019, have we learned to depend on other things? What's your keyblade? When you need direction in your life, what's your keyblade? What's the first thing that you run to? Who's the first person you talk to? What's the first, th first thing you think of? Is God truly your dependence? Are you dependent on him? And really, I think one of the things that can tell us is, what is your first resort when something goes wrong and you need direction? Do you call somebody? Do you look something up on the internet? Do you find something else? Those things are great. Those are resources. Use them. But when you need direction, if you're truly dependent on God, the first thing you do is you get on your knees and you say, God, if you don't direct me, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know how this is going to work out. God, I need your direction. God, I need a pillar of cloud. God, I need you to show me the way. Because God, I, I don't want Siri telling me where to go. I don't want my friends telling me where to go. I want the king to tell me to go. God, direct me. God, direct me. And Moses understood this principle. He said, I'm dependent on God. No one else. Not even the advice of the people that I'm leading. I'm dependent on God. And if I trust him, he will lead me. If I trust him, he will lead me. I believe in this passage we learned from Moses the three keys of learning to depending on God are one, depending on God for direction, but also depending on God for deliverance. The reality is that these people, they were slaves in Egypt, absolutely slaves in Egypt, and God sent Moses to save them. God sent Moses to save them. They needed to be saved. They needed to be taken out. They needed to be delivered. And Moses was in some situations where if God didn't answer him, things were going to go down, okay? Things were not going to work out, but he had 100% faith that God was going to come through, through, him, through for them. There were absolute miracles that happened. This was absolutely amazing. I want to I read you this story that Moses literally takes the people from Egypt. They kind of sneak away from the Egyptians, and they're sleeping by the Red Sea. And as they're sleeping, as they're getting ready to keep on moving, they realize that the Egyptians have realized that Moses took the people, and now they're coming to capture those people back. We're going to pick up here in Exodus, the same book, chapter 14, 23 to 29, as we see Moses and the people trusting God and being dependent on him for deliverance. It says the Egyptians pursued them 
And all Pharaoh's horses, the Egyptians are chasing the Israelites because they've escaped. And all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen, followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariots so that they had difficulty driving. God was clearly on one side. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. These people are wise. They realize we are fighting against God's people. 26 says, the Lord said to Moses, Stretch over your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians. Now, if you've ever seen a picture of this, it's, it's pretty epic, right? You see Moses and you see the sea beginning to literally split in half right in front of him. And Moses was normally known to carry a staff. In this moment, I just see Moses with the keyblade. <laughs> just see Moses with the keyblade, baby, splitting the sea in half. He stood over the sea so that the waters may flow back, flow back back over the Egyptians and the chariots and their horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea with that good old key blade. And at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. Can I get a hashtag wrecked in the chat? The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites in the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea. You need, to, you need to catch this wording. They went through the sea on dry ground. That doesn't even like make sense. You can't walk through the sea and be dry at the same time. But this was such a mir miraculous event of God that God had delivered them so beautifully that even the ground in which they stood, even though it was below sea level, it was dry. With a wall of water, on their right and a wall of water on their left. Can you imagine walking through this moment and just seeing the majesty, the beauty, the power, the authority of God? But before that epic part happened, can you imagine the raw dependence that Moses needed for the deliverance of his people? We always talk about the Red Sea, but can we really do a play-by-play -play of the moments that are happening before it? I mean, literally, we got Moses and these huge group of Israelites and they see in the distance the chariots and the horses. They're loud. They're making tons of noise. They're probably cheering. We're coming for you. And they see them and they're realizing, guys, we got to go. They're coming to kill us. But Moses looked to his left and Moses looked to his right, said, we have no escape route. We have absolutely nowhere to go. And you know what that made them do? It made them desperate. God, God we can't go to the left. We can't go to the right. We have nowhere to go. We cannot be saved. We're going to die. They're going to kill us. They outpower us. We have farmers and all these people. They've got trained warriors. They've got people with weapons. They've got horses. We don't stand a chance. We are desperate. But I can tell you, but being desperate is such a beautiful place. Because when you're desperate, you become dependent. When you're in a place in your life where you are desperate, it forces you to become dependent and say, God, I'm looking to my left. God, I'm looking to my right. There, there, there is no other way out of this. So God, I, I might sound crazy, but you know what I got to do with this moment? I got to stretch my keyblade over the Red Sea and believe that you can split it in half because that's the God that I know. And God, I'm going to be so dependent on you that I'm not just going to trust in technology. I'm not just going to trust in Siri. I'm not just going to trust in video games and Google and YouTube for advice. My friends and family, those are great things. I'm going to be dependent on God to save me from my darkest situations. I'm going to trust on you, God. I'm going to trust on you for deliverance. And I'm going to keep believing. And I want to challenge you. When you're in a dark situation, when you're being chased by the Egyptians, when you have nowhere to go, depend on God. He will deliver you. He will save you. But are you dependent on him? What's your keyblade? When things start going wrong, what do you turn your attention to? What's your first go-to? Or do you do like Moses and just say, God, I'm throwing my hands up because I just surrender. I don't know what else to do. I got nowhere else to go. God, I need you to do a miracle. I need you to do a miracle. But the reality is, God had commanded Moses to lift up his hand 
and Moses actually did it that required faith. It doesn't show us that Moses sat there and said, God, uh, are you sure you can do this, bro? God, I mean, I mean, they're really close. So like we got, we ain't got time for like, you know, do overs. We got one shot at this. Like, are you sure? He just said, okay, I'm dependent. I'm desperate, which leads me to be dependent. God, I need you to make a way. Even it's as miraculous as splitting the sea in half. I believe that you can do it. And I believe that you'll do it. Why? Because you love us and you will deliver us. This was the God. This was the God that they knew. This was the God that they know. God has proven time and time and time again that we are able to be dependent on him. Same people, same scenario, different timeline. Let's look at Exodus chapter 16, verse number four. Look at this. These people were starving. They're still lost. They're trying to get to the promised land. Same group of people, same Moses, same leader. These people, they need food. They finally got away from the Egyptians. They got through the Red Sea, but now another problem arises. They're hungry. They need food. Two chapters later, the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven. You need food? You're desperate because you're starving? That's, that's exactly where I do my best work. When you're desperate and dependent, I make a way. He says, I'll rain down bread from heaven for you. And the people are to go out each day and gather enough just for that day. And this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. This verse is so beautiful because the people, they were desperate. They had a need. They were starving. So God said, I will literally bring down food from heaven, manna, bread from heaven for you to eat. But look at his special instructions. He said, but only gather enough for that day. This ain't no buffet. Don't be taking leftovers. Don't be trying to stick some in your pocket. Take only enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Why would God instruct them just to have enough for one day? Because God only wanted them to have enough just for one day. So that when the morning came, yet again, they were dependent on God and not dependent on his blessing. God said, in this way, I'll test them to see whether they follow my instructions. In this way, I'll test them. Can we rephrase it? To see whether they're dependent on me or dependent on the resource. I'd ask you today, do you believe that your provision comes from your job or from your God who is using your job as a way to provide for you? That's the deliverance. That's God saving you. That's God blessing you. Can I tell you that God is the constant. You could lose your job tomorrow, but does that mean that your provision is gone? Nope, just means it's time to fill out some applications. He is your provider. God makes a way. And he said to the people, I only want you to take enough. I only want you to take enough for today so that tomorrow you come back to me and say, God, we're desperate, we need you. And I will delightly bless you. I will bless you. But I want you to be dependent on me, not on your skills, not on your personality, not on the people around you. I want you to be dependent on me. I know you've been working that same job for 25 years and you're really good at it. But do, are you aware that it's been God's provision for these past 25 years? Not your skills, not your personality. Are we dependent on God or do we have another keyblade? That when life gets rough, when we need to be delivered, we, we take our Achilles blade and say, God, this, this is what I'm going to use to get my situation out. Or do we say, God, I'm dependent on you. When we're desperate, we're dependent. But what are we dependent on? It's in this passage that we see the three keys on how to depend on God that Moses teaches us. And I want to talk to you about the third one. The first one, Moses teaches us to be dependent on God for direction. Then he teaches us to be dependent on God for deliverance but I think the most important one we can learn is to be dependent on God for our deepest desire. As I begin to talk through the first two principles we're learning today, being dependent on God for direction and deliverance, there's many of us that, to be honest, have been in your shoes that are asking ourselves, man, I'll be honest, Pastor Susie, it'd be a lot easier to be dependent on God if I saw a stinking pillar of cloud in this. Cal, can you put that picture back up? If I saw this in the sky, okay, if I saw this in the sky, it might be a little bit easier for me to believe God. It might be a little bit. I mean, if I saw this kind of stuff today, if I saw bread fall out of heaven, if I looked up and I saw this cloud pillar and was like, follow me, I might be like, I can get down with that. I can believe that. 
if I was able to see this today, man, I'd have no problem being dependent on God. But can we pause? Can I share a secret with you? Can I share a little confession? I'll be honest. I have so much respect for these kind of pictures. I have so much respect for this artwork. But is anybody with me when they look at this stuff? This, this artwork kind of freaks me out. I'm not going to lie. There's something about the artwork, something about the style. I have no skill. I could never do that, but I'm just going to be real. This, these kind of pictures, I don't know why, but they freak me out. Okay, this episode of Secrets with Susie is now over. We're getting back to the sermon. But these people, they knew God was providing for them because there was a pillar of cloud. And some of you might say, yeah, dude, if I saw that, yeah, I'd probably follow it too. If I saw that, It might be easier for me to be dependent. If there was stinking bread falling from the sky and Jesus was like, yo, eat up, people, I might be, I might be a little bit, I might have an easier time depending on God. And we ask ourselves, man, God, you did so many miracles in the Bible. So many miracles in the Bible. God, why don't you do them anymore? Man, we're at an all-time low of people who have faith in Jesus. God, don't you want more people to follow you? If you just did some miracles, man, people, they would believe in you. I mean, God, if you just started, like, dropping bread out of the sky, dropping free, like, 2080 TIs, like, people, people would worship you, man. Like, God, I mean, that would be so much easier. God, why don't you do it? I believe, believe it's because of this principle right here. Because Moses is teaching us to be dependent not on God's blessing, but being dependent rather on his presence. Let me explain to you what I mean. So many people in today's world, we're looking for God to do miracles. Can I tell you that he actually is? He actually is doing miracles. But can I tell you probably where he's doing the, f- the most, like the least amount of miracles in the United States, in, in westernized civilization? Because we have so much. We have technology. We have iPhones. We have great computers. We have real life keyblades. We have so much that at times we feel like, what do we need? God for. We don't need to run to him. And the reality is, someone's like, man, I've been praying and I feel like God's not showing up to my party, man. He's not showing up to my party. But can I tell you that most of the time, God might be not showing up to your party in the way that you might want him to, simply because he wasn't invited. I believe that God would be performing miracles in our world today, if, and he is, but we'd be doing them more on a scale that we could see. On a scale, things like that. It's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. The same God that did the pillar of cloud, the bread from heaven. It's the same God today. Why doesn't he do it? Because back then, people were dependent on him. Today, we just want the blessing. We're dependent on technology. We're depending on all of these different things. But Moses had a different heart. And he taught us to be dependent on his deepest desire. And his deepest desire wasn't direction. And it wasn't deliverance. It was just having God. I want to read to you verses 13 to 15. God has a conversation with Moses. They're in the tent of meeting. All the people, they're seeing the pillar of cloud. And they're watching. They're watching all this happen. They're saying, wow, what a miraculous event. But then look what it says in verse 13. Moses, if you are pleased with me, teach me to know your way so I may know you. God, I just want to know you. He doesn't even say, teach me your ways so that I can actually lead the people. He doesn't say, hey, teach me the ways so I can get out of this long journey that we've been lost in. He doesn't say, teach me your ways so that I can be blessed. Teach me your ways so I can do this. He says, God, teach me your ways so that I might know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that the nation is your people. And the Lord replied. He gave Moses the desire of his heart because he knew he was dependent. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. But then look what Moses says. This is Moses with a huge amount of pressure and weight on his shoulders. Thousands of people following him. Waiting on his lead so that they might save him. There are people that are starving. There are people that they don't know where they're going to be next. There are people that are weak, elderly people that can barely walk themselves. So much pressure on Moses. Can I tell you what Moses really, really, really could use at that time? is a lifeboat, a saving grace, a miracle. He could really use the blessing. It would solve so many of his problems. Can you imagine the pressure and the responsibility of being Moses in this moment? And he tells God, this is what I want most. 
rather than being just dependent on deliverance and for direction, God, he says, if your presence does not go with us, then don't send us up from here. God, life would be so much easier in the promised land. Man, I can tell you, there's so much blessings. We are lost. We don't know where we're going. We're following a stinking cloud that's like floating in the sky, and at night it just lights on fire. God, where we're in right now is very, very inconvenient. We're hungry. We've got all these peoples, these babies that are crying, old people that can't walk. God, this is very inconvenient. But if you're not going to come with us, I'm staying right here. Because I would rather be in the midst of the struggle than in the promised land without my God. If your presence, if you're not coming with us, don't bother sending us because we're not moving. He was dependent on the presence of God. God was his deepest desire. Sure, he wanted and needed direction. Sure, he wanted and needed deliverance. But above all, he just wanted God's presence. He just wanted God. He just wanted God. And I believe that this is why God showed up at the party because he was so desired to be there. Today, we want God to show up at our party as long as he brings a drink, as long as he brings a dish, as long as God brings something with him. Sure, he can hang out at the party. No big deal. But I believe that God would ask you a question today. What's your keyblade? Do you want God for the blessings of his hand? Do you want God just for his hand or do you want him for his heart? Do you love his presence? Do you just love God so much that you're dependent on him every day? Saying, God, I can't get through another day without you. You are my joy. You are my strength. And God, sure, I would love some direction. I'd love some deliverance. I would love to get out of this journey that we've been lost in, but I'd rather stay lost with you than found without you. And I believe that it breaks my heart that there are millions of people today that call themselves to be a follower of Jesus, but they would absolutely be 100% fine going the rest of their life without God's presence as long as they could keep God's blessing. As long as I can get direction and as long as I can get deliverance and I can get out of this crap hole that I'm in, just, just loving Jesus and having his presence, uh, I, mean, I don't think I really need that. Yeah, God, you can invite, I'll invite you to my party as long as you bring a dish with you, man. There are people that would be 100% okay going the rest of their lives without God's presence as long as they could have God's blessing. But I believe Moses is teaching us here to not just be dependent on the things he can do for you, but just being dependent on him because you love him. Just give me Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. I don't want to be satisfied with anything else. And I believe that sometimes God will keep you in the loading screen. He'll keep you lost on the journey that you're in until you learn to want him more than you want his blessing. I believe that with all my heart that we're praying sometimes and we need an answer to our prayers. We need God to come through. We need God to make a way. And it feels like God's keeping us in the loading screen. God's keeping us in the waiting phase and we come dependent on other things. We're saying, God, why don't you give me the answer to my prayer? God, why don't you give me the thing that I need? God, why don't you give me direction? God, why don't you give me deliverance? And I believe that sometimes God won't give you the answer to your prayer until you want, until you learn to love him more than the answer to your prayer. And can I tell you that God loves you too much to give you something good. He wants to give you something great, but what is great is not always the answer to your prayer. What's great is just more of him. The best thing that you'll ever need is just God, just more of God in your life, more of his presence, loving him. And I believe with all my heart, and I've experienced this in my life, that sometimes God loves you so much that when it comes to wanting the answer to your prayers, God won't give you the answer to your prayer. He'll just give you more of his presence. Because the reality is that when it comes to being dependent you and I have been guilty of this. We've needed deliverance, we've needed direction, and we were on our knees begging God, God bless us, God bless us, God bless us. God, we're dependent on you. God, we need you. And then he gave it to us. And then we realize, okay, I think I'm good for a while. I, th I think I'm good for a while. Okay, all right. Well, well God, thanks. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll catch up again when I am in another crisis. Next time I need deliverance, I'll we'll hit you up. We'll, we'll talk again soon. God bless you. The reality is that sometimes God keeps you in that loading screen because when you're in that loading screen, you're desperate. It causes you to be dependent. 
and it puts you in a position where you realize that you need him. When you're desperate, you spend more time in prayer. And it's not God being cruel, putting you in a position where you need to spend time in prayer. It's that God loves you so much that one, he wants to be with you. And God loves you so much that he wants to give you the best thing. And he knows that sometimes and all the time that what's best for you is actually not even always the answer to your prayer. It's just more of God's presence. So sometimes the loading screen is the best thing we can be in because it teaches us to be dependent and to learn to love God. But my question is, do you love God enough that you could pray the prayer Moses prayed? That God, sure, I'd love to be out of this season. But if you're not going to come with me, don't even bother getting me out. I'd rather stay here with you than be in the promised land without you. God loves you so much that at times it may seem difficult, but he just wants to be close to you. He wants to teach you to be dependent, 100 dependent on him rather than the other things in your life. The Bible says this, that God is a jealous God. That means the other key blades that you have in your life, the things that you run to when you're struggling, the things that you're dependent on, God is jealous of your key blades because he wants to be the thing that you run to. He wants to be that thing. He wants to be it so bad because he loves you. He wants you to be with him. He's a heavenly father that desires that his children would run to him rather than running to other things. But are you dependent on him or have you become dependent on your job? Can I tell you that the best answer to our prayer is not actually the answer to our prayer. It's actually just more of his presence. But are you dependent on him? for every moment of your life? Or have you grown dependent on your skills, dependent on your job, your money, your personality? Or have you been reminded what the circle maker taught us, that raw dependence? Because this is what happened with Moses. That because they were in a season of raw dependence, that was the ingredient God used to perform his greatest miracles. Because they were dependent, they got to see the pillar of God. Because they were dependent, God spit the Red Sea. Because they were dependent, bread came down from heaven. And I'd ask us today, what would our world look like if we were still dependent on God? It's not that God's not showing up to the party. It's that he hasn't been invited. Because we've got so many other options that we can get through first before we consult God. And even when we do invite him, we say, God, you can come to the party, but you better bring a dish, brother. You better bring a blessing with you. Because I don't just want to hang out with you at the party. I want to eat those chips you're bringing, homie. I want your blessing. I want your blessing. What if we just forgot about the blessing? I understand you're struggling. I understand life's rough. I've been there. But what if we just loved so God? God what if we loved God so much that we said, God, like Moses, if your presence is not going to come with us out of this struggle... I'd rather stay in the struggle with you. You, God, are my deepest desire. Sure, God, I'm going to be dependent on you for deliverance, dependent on you for uh, direction. But God, I'm going to be dependent on you for my deepest desire, and that is you. I just want to be with you, God. With you. Take the world, take everything else away. Take my stream away. Take my income away. Take my family away. Take my personality away. Take my ability to communicate away. Take the world, but just give me Jesus. Because Jesus plus nothing still equals everything. Are you dependent on him for your daily bread, for your provision, for your direction, for your deliverance? Is he your deepest desire and I want to challenge you if it's not can I tell you that God loves you enough that he's gracious with you he's merciful towards you wants to take you on a journey just like he was with the Egyptians with the Israelites excuse me teaching them to become dependent on him and that may be the reason that maybe you're stuck in your loading screen because you haven't learned to become dependent on God you haven't learned to just want him more than you want anything else and that's why prayer is so important. Learning to trust him, learning to just desire his presence, wanting to be with him, wanting to talk to him, wanting to read his word. That's why this week we're going to do something that we do every single year as a church. It's our third year doing it. It's a week of prayer. 
And I would love to invite you to come out with us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, February 4th through the 7th, just for one hour from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. I know life's busy, but if we're really desperate, we'll be dependent. And if we really love his presence like Moses did, we'll find a way. We'll find a way to carve out an hour just to be with God. We're going to be praying through multiple things in our community. We're going to be praying through families, praying through reaching more people for Christ, praying through the health of our church. And this week, can I tell you, we need God more than ever. Right now, there are some things happening in our life that are in, in, our, in our world that we live in that are causing us to be desperate and dependent on God. And we're going to be praying and talking through, as a church, how are we going to navigate? How are we going to react and respond when it comes to what's happening in the world considering the topic of abortion? And we're going we're gonna to get along with God. And we're going to talk through these things. And we're going to pray in God for God to help us for God to help us, and for God to help us not only stand firm to what we believe, but to love those around us that might be doing things that are different than we do. That's the God that we serve. But we've got things happening in our world we've got to talk about and we've got to pray about. And I want to invite you every single night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be getting into God's presence. We're going to show God that we want Him, that we love Him, but we don't just want His blessing. We want him. I believe that Moses taught us an incredible principle of three keys on how to depend on God. Trusting him, relying heavily on him for our direction, deliverance. And I believe that at times God answered those because God was his deepest desire. What is your keyblade? What do you rely on most? And I pray in Jesus' name that tonight your heart will be open to realize that God wants it to be him. Let's pray together. God, we just come before you acknowledging that we are really just not as strong as we really think that sometimes we are. We're not as smart, God, as sometimes we think that we are. God, we're reminded of things like the fact that even though we've been developing technology for thousands of years now, We have not yet in thousands of years developed technology to go to the deepest parts of the ocean in which you created in seconds. It's taken us thousands of years and we still haven't been able to explore even probably 1% of the entire galaxy. But God, you created it when you spoke it into existence. That's you, God. Great and mighty. And I ask today that God, you'd help us to be dependent on you, desperate for more of you, desperate for your presence. Teach us to just love you, God, to just love you, not be dependent on other things. Sure, planning, savings accounts, advice, those are great things. But if we didn't have those, if we didn't have 401ks like Moses didn't, would we still believe and trust that we'd be okay? Because we have you. So God, I ask that our hearts today would be dependent on you, dependent on you. God, may you be our deepest desire. May we pray a prayer, God, like Moses that said, if you're not going to come with us, then don't even send us out from here. We'd rather stay in the struggle with you than to be delivered without you there. And it's when we reach that place that, God, I believe that we can then be delivered and have you. So God, we ask you today in Jesus' name that you would help our hearts to love you, help our hearts to bless you. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, hope you guys have been blessed by our service tonight. So glad you guys are popping in. Want to remind you guys, okay, don't forget, week of prayer, like I said, starting this Monday through Thursday, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. But also, we're continuing to continuing to read this book. If you haven't picked one up already, it's not too late. We're only, we've only read chapters 1 and 2. Again, we're reading this as a community, talking about it in our experience groups. If you're not signed up for one, get yourself signed up in one. This week, I want to encourage you. During a week of prayer before next week, do your best to read chapter number three. Every week, we're just going to pull out important principles. From chapters one and two, we t- took out the principle of learning raw 
dependence. And every single week, I'm be talking through new principles that we're gauging from this book, but then also backing up and really relying on the Bible as our true source of wisdom. Just pulling out key principles, but really dissecting them from the Bible, which is God's good book of truth. It's alive. It's active. I want to encourage you guys, make sure to read that this week. Come out to a week of prayer and believing that as we learn to be dependent on God, as we learn to get desperate for Him, that miracles start happening, that God starts moving in our lives. And I believe it's going to be incredible incredible season for our church as we are in the loading screen in so many different areas of your life, the life of our church, the physical location, the land center, all that stuff. You know what, God, if we never get the land center, if we can keep you, I've got more than I need being dependent on God. But guys, we love you so much. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at church. Every single week, I want to challenge you. Hey, invite a friend to be with you. If this blesses you in any way, shape, or form, don't you want your friends and family to be blessed? Send them an invite. Send them a link on social media. Get people in the church service with us. I believe God is moving and making a way in people's lives, and we'd love to get God's truth out to as many people as possible possible. Before we go, ladies and gentlemen, we showed that good old God Squad top five video. And ladies and gentlemen, this week's winner is... Congratulations to this week's best of the best. Remember to send in your best clips to top five at godsquadchurch.com. And this could be you. Tune in next week to find out who will take it all. Let's go! My man 7-1. I know he's in the chat. Can we get some hype for 7-1? He is this week's best clip of the week. Congratulations, Thomas, man. I love you. You and Tracy praying for you. You guys are absolutely next level legends. But guys, can you beat 7's clip? Come back next week and find out. Make sure to send your clips into the God Squad Top 5. You can find out information at GodSquadChurch.com slash Top 5. There'll be a link in the chat for you. Get your clips in to see if Thomas is going to be thrown again for two weeks in a row or Will your, will your clip take him off? Come back and find out. But guys, again, thank you so much. We love you. We appreciate you. I know that some of you are in the loading screen. And just know we're praying for you. We got people that are going to be available in our Discord right now that would love to pray with you. We got a male and a female. They'd love to answer questions. But if not, maybe you don't even believe in God and you're just like, man, I really like the Keyblade analogy, dude. Come hang out in our Discord anyway. We'd love to get to know you, spend some time with you. There's games, there's everything. Come in the Discord. We'd love to get to know you. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. From all of us here at God Squad Church, catch you guys next week. God bless, guys. Take care. Pretending not to care, seeing is believing now it's here. Read my face, there's a past I can't.